Around 100 years ago, infectious or communicable diseases such as smallpox were the main cause of death and illness. But this changed with improved sanitation, vaccinations, antibiotics and healthcare. Although communicable diseases still exist, the rise of non-communicable diseases, which are also known as NCDs, in the present day feature as an important threat to human health and well-being. NCDs are generally chronic in nature and not transmitted from one person to the next. Many tend to develop over a long time frame and progress slowly. NCDs account for almost two-thirds of all global deaths, that's about 38 million each year. And of these, 75% occur in low and middle income countries. NCDs also cause significant premature deaths and are not necessarily associated with old age. In fact, 16 million of all NCD deaths occur in people who are under 70 years old. The four main types of NCDs include cardiovascular disease, which includes stroke, cancer, chronic lung disease, and also diabetes. The primary risk factors for NCDs are smoking, lack of physical activity, alcohol, and salt intake. However, climate change is also a potential risk factor for NCD development and advancement, and my talk will further explore the mechanisms, how scientists quantify this relationship, and also provide examples of how climate change policies can reduce NCDs. Climate change is a global problem with regional effects and will alter exposures including temperature, rainfall, ozone levels and extreme weather events such as droughts, floods, fires and storms. These exposures can affect NCD development and, and progression both directly and indirectly. Human exposure to an increase in temperature or extreme heat can trigger a cascade of direct biological responses such as increased cardiac output, redistribution of the blood flow away from the core organs in the body to the periphery, reduced vasodilation, sweat rate and potential dehydration, all of which increase the risk of cardiovascular problems. Similarly, impaired thermoregulation and responses such as airway inflammation from breathing in hot air can actually result in an increase in the risk of respiratory diseases. An increase in temperatures coupled with reduced rainfall can increase the levels of air pollutants. For example, high level UV light promotes the formation of ground level ozone which has been linked to cardiovascular and respiratory diseases and deaths. Similarly, the high level of airborne pollen and the early arrival of spring has increased the risk of respiratory and allergic diseases. Extreme weather events have caused damage to infrastructure and homes resulting in greater injuries. But climate change exposures are not all negative. Increased exposure to UV light can reduce autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis and high winter temperatures in temperate regions can actually reduce the risk of cardiovascular and respiratory disease. Indirectly, extreme weather events such as droughts and floods can ruin crops, food yields and increase food insecurity potentially affecting millions of people around the world, especially those dependent on subsistence practices. This results not only in poor general health, but takes people into this vicious cycle of malnutrition, poverty and disease. The predictability of weather is also affected by climate change. Fast is like only one level temperature. Well, the climate never changes, like say 40 years ago. My dad say that for, for five days ahead, they can tell you like, ah, okay, going to rain from now five days, and be sure it's going to rain. Or it will be sunny day for five days, 100% it's going to be sunny day. But now at the present moment, the native or the indigenous people that cannot say if it's going to rain, are going to be sunny in a couple hours because it changes a lot now for us here in, in the Amazon. This uncertainty and the occurrence of extreme weather events can trigger mental health problems including post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression and also suicide. So, given the variety of risk factors for the development of NCDs, how do we tease out the contribution of climate change from all the other risk factors 
such as smoking, to work out the attributable burden of disease. A common approach is by calculating the Disability Adjusted Life Year, or DALI, as a measure of burden of disease by aggregating two key measures, the years of life lost from premature death, or YLL, and the years lost due to disability, or YLD. The YLD takes into account the severity and time lived with disability. The DALI provides a meaningful way to compare various diseases because relative weights are given to account for deaths at a younger age or diseases that cause prolonged illness. Climate change, which has occurred until the year 2000, was responsible for at least 5.5 million total DALIs that year. The population attributable fraction, or PAF, can be used to capture the proportion of NCD burden attributable to climate change based on three factors. The total burden of disease due to the risk factor, or risk factors, the, the exposure response relationships for the diseases of interest, and the current or projected exposure distributions within the study population. By using this methodology, it is not only the attributable, but also the avoidable burden of disease that can be measured. For example, with different future climate scenarios, policy measures, socio-economic conditions, or adaptation strategies. Climate change adaptation is about creating adjustment to deal with a changing environment, while mitigation is actually dealing with the root cause of climate change. Well-designed climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies could provide win-win opportunities or co-benefits by reducing both greenhouse gas emissions while also reducing NCD risks in population. The energy, urban planning and food and agriculture sectors represent three key areas where co-benefits for both health and the environment can be achieved. For example, lowering urban and indoor air pollution by generating cleaner energy can reduce the risk of cardiovascular and respiratory outcomes. In India, a modelling exercise shows that transfer from the use of biomass to about 150 million low emission cook stoves reduces health damaging air pollutants by about 0.5 to 1 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent over 10 years, while also saving 2 million premature deaths, mainly in women and children. Moving away from fossil fuel dependent cars towards transport run by clean or renewable energy can both reduce air pollutants and the risk of lung cancer and respiratory disease. Improving urban infrastructure to increase walkability and enable safe cycling also indirectly reduces dependence on cars and has the potential to reduce the burden from cancer, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular and health related problems. For example, in London, increased active transport is estimated to reduce the burden of ischemic heart disease by about 10 to 15 percent in one year, saving around 1,400 to 2,200 deaths per 1 million people. Furthermore, improved livability by increasing green spaces in neighbourhoods and also street trees and also including more footpaths and reducing the distance to public transport can enhance social connectivity and improve mental health outcomes while also minimising urban heat island effects and health consequences of heat stress. The reduced production and consumption of meat and animal source products can reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well as fat intake and lessen cardiovascular and colorectal cancer risk. To summarise, climate change is likely to exacerbate risks in cardiovascular, respiratory diseases, mental health, injuries and also malnutrition to name a few. These health impacts will place added pressure on health and social systems, particularly in low and middle income countries where the burden of NCDs is increasing at a very fast pace. Interventions to reduce carbon emissions can also produce substantial co-benefits for health.